Hey everyone, I'm Katie Fatella. If you can't see me, you can turn on speaker view um, and I should pop up for you. I work for the Nora Project. I'm the senior program director and I'm going to be moderating this event. Um, we are excited to have our performers joining us right now um, and we're going to get started in just a few minutes. But as you are getting logged on, if you're new, please um, introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from today. And this is your chance to let our performers know in the chat what exactly you loved about their performances today and to start listing any questions that you might have. So we're gonna get started in just a minute. I see we have Galen and Maysoon and Tina and Lachi here and I'm looking to see, um, and Gabriel is here too, awesome. The band is here. Literally. Okay, we're all here, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, we're gonna give it one more minute and make sure everybody that's planning on being here is here and then we are going to get started. So thank you all so much. We'll be starting in just one more minute. Can you let me know if I'm like really loud? Sometimes I accidentally blast people out of the water. You sound great, Galen. Okay, good, thank you. Nice to see you all. Hi, Mitsu. Nice to see you. Hi, hey. I'm not really gonna pay attention. I'm just gonna pay attention to the silent auction to make sure I win my stuff. <laughs> I know, I'm, yep. I mean, like, <laughs> Just give us some updates periodically. I, I yeah. bid on a cuff. I bid on earrings. I bid on a picture of the Little Mermaid. I bid on, what else did I bid on? Oh, hey I guys. On hey. Hi, Lachi. Lachi here. Hi. You guys can see me. You can hear me, see me, all that stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. awesome. Oh, there's Gabriel nice. too. I see you now. You're all on different pages. That's hilarious. Hi. <laughs> me and Tina, I see you. Hi, Tina. Hi, Tina. If you're setting up your Zoom and you want to see our performers, you can click, hover over their little box in gallery view and choose the three dots and choose add pin. And that way our performers will all be within your sites. Wait, you can add multiple pins? You know it. You are changing my life right now. <laughs> um, I did not know that. Yes, add pin. How come I'm, okay, pin, pin. Pinning so many people. That's awesome. Okay, now what? I go to gallery view and it suddenly, oh my God. I think that might have worked. Work? Uh, no, but I also have a Chromebook, which basically. It's just everything. too much work for me. I'm looking at everyone. It's nice. It's fun. Yeah, it is yeah. good. I can't figure it out. All Yay. right. Thank you all for joining us today. We've got 37 people with us today and I'm hoping we're gonna get some more to join in soon. We are starting a little early, so I know we'll, we'll get some stragglers, but thank you all for joining us for this talkback session. And can we give a, an ASL round of applause to our performers for an incredible performance today? Unbelievable. Aww. We are just floating on air today. This was beyond our wildest dreams. So thank you all for your talent, for lending it to us, um, and for being here to let us get to know you a little bit better. Um, we're especially excited to talk to you a little bit more about your activism. And so I'm going to go ahead and start some questions if you're ready. Everybody good? Well, thank you for having us, for sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> all right. So Lachi, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, can you share a little bit with us about your work with respectability? Yeah, for sure. So I've been working with respectability for uh, not quite up to a year now. Um, I found them through, uh, they were beginning a speakers bureau here in New York. And um, I, I came in and I joined on board because I was very excited to uh, get into the space as a speaker. Uh, but more importantly, um, just as a female, a woman of color, they were having a speakers bureau for females. And through them, I have done a lot of uh, different speeches regarding how to uh, be more inclusive in the workplace and for grant writing um, in order to have more folks with disabilities behind the scenes giving the grants, um, folks with disabilities um, during the hiring and firing process when it comes to uh, workplaces. Uh, through them, I've spoken to corporations like the Heinz organization, you know, the catch up and, uh, you know, organizations um, and, and panels that were backed by things like Coca-Cola. Um, so it's been like a really uh, intense and very jam packed ride ever since I joined. And uh, they're doing big things. I'm really excited to be a part of it. 
I do a lot of work on my own outside of them and with other organizations. But yes, through them, I have been doing a lot of speaking, um, uh, like I said, to organizations regarding things like the 504. And there's some really great content on the respectability website. So definitely something to check out. Um, all right, thank you so much, Lachi. Uh, we'll sure. go on to Maysoon now. So Maysoon, um, in your article in Refinery29, you mentioned that you uh, work to eliminate ableist language in your sets. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that process and maybe provide some suggestions for the group about how to do that, how to eliminate ableist language in your own lives? Sure. So um, when I started doing stand-up comedy, I was super offensive. I was ableist. I was racist. I was fattest. I was, you know, slut shaming. It was kind of the thing to do in the 90s. And the reason that I stopped doing that was because I was at a show and someone came up to me at the end of my show and said, you know, that joke that you did about pedophilia it reminded me of the worst, darkest moment of my life. So like, thanks for that. And I sat back and I was like, no, that's not my job. Like, I want to make people laugh. I don't want to use slurs that were hurled at them in a painful way. And so once I became aware of language and words mattering, ableist language came along with that. And what's really interesting about ableist language it's super challenging for me to cut out ableist language because I'm from Jersey and my two favorite words are crazy and stupid. So like I want to be crazy rich and live in a stupid mansion and like it's very hard for me to stop using those words. So when I write, what I do is I let loose. I use stupid, I use crazy, I use idiot, moron, dumb, lame, cripple, whatever I want. Then I go back in and I literally excise those words. I take out those words and it really like gets me to be creative. Like what's the more creative word in this sentence than dumb? What's the more creative word in this sentence than stupid? What's the more creative word than fat? How can I do least harm and be the funniest? So I, I love the challenge, but if I sat and edited myself every sentence, it would kill my creativity. So I just let it loose and then I pull it back. And every single day I learn. So sometimes I still use ableist language. I don't know that I'm using ableist language and someone will tell me and I don't fight them. I'm like, no, it's not ableist because I never heard that before. I learn every single day what is so that I can do better. And I have to just tell you a very interesting thing about Refinery29. In Refinery29, I talk about identity first versus person first language. And that article was actually initially written for the New York Times. And I pulled the article from the New York Times because they were doing an entire section on disability without a disabled editor. So even though in the article, I explained that I like identity first because I'm a disabled person. I don't like, you know, have, I'm not a person with a disability. I can't just leave my disability behind me. I'm a disabled person. When the New York Times editor gave me my first round of notes, she corrected my identity first language to person first language, even though in the article I explained it. So words matter, it's a long journey. If someone tells you it's ableist, listen to them. You don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to be perfect, but trying is really fun. Just words to live by. <laughs> Amazing, thank you Maysoon for that. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, we're always, always working on like self-improvement and doing better. And I think it's just such an important message of just, just keep trying and be creative because your words do matter. And there are, there are less harmful things that you can say always. So just keep trying and trying. Love it. Thank you, Maysoon, so much. Um, Tina, I've got a question for you. Tina, um, what advice do you have to aspiring painters and visual artists? Well, my um, advice is if they want to become an artist or a painter, they need to follow their dreams. That's so important. So important, Tina. And tell us, what are some of the things that you think about when you're painting? Um, I think about my grandmother a lot when I'm painting or drawing and stuff. Amazing. 
Well, Tina, we really loved your segment and your painting is so incredible. And I can't wait to see who wins it in the auction. I know it's been mm. a bidding war on your painting. So well done, Tina. Thank you so much. Um, okay, Gabriel, we'll go on to you. Um, you mentioned in your intro that disability has in some ways been a new beginning for you. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that for us? Yeah, so a little background on my, excuse me, on my disability, I, I was in a diving accident in 2008 and uh, I broke my C5 vertebrae. And so now I have a, a, a spinal cord injury, um, quadriplegia. <clears throat> and before my injury, I was, um, I was a musician. I played piano mainly. Um, so using my hands a lot, I used my body a lot. I played sports was very active with my body. Um, and post-injury, I lost the use of my hands and pretty much armpits down, um, lost all movement and, and sensation. Um, so I lost my ability to play piano and use, use my body in the ways that I used to. Um, and it, it took me a while to realize that I could still, I could still do the same things. I just had to find different ways to do them. Um, and I think a, a big piece of what I do is interacting with my limitations. That's what a cripple's dance is all about. Mm. And um, using those limitations as creative fuel. Um, and I, I didn't kind of, I wasn't able to kind of conceptualize that early on after my injury, but um, now that I'm, I'm 12 years in, um, I've realized I've been doing that since the beginning of my injury. Um, and so it was, a, it was a new beginning in that, you know, I lost, I lost something that I had that I really valued and I really loved. Mm -hmm. And I, stepped into something that, you know, I, it's taken a while for me to figure out how to love my body and how to love the way that I share my music, the way that I share my writing, um, and find the love that exists within that. Um, so it's, it's been a, a beautiful, challenging, um, process of evolution um yeah that Gabriel, that's really incredible really incredible. i just bid on tina's painting <laughs> <laughs> just Yay. keep we're going <laughs> yeah, there's like a smiley heart and it's like eating cupcakes it's really cool you get a little oh, yes. more than 15 minutes until the auction closes so if you're on this call just make sure you have your screen split so you've got the auction and the zoom <laughs> meeting there's still and plenty of time to get your bids in i know how people are they wait till the very end you have to wait right. till the very end because that's exciting. when it gets hot yeah very exciting. But that's when it gets hot i know i had a bidding war over a green bay packer football one time at another auction which few would bid uh, from Minnesota, but my dad's a Packer fan. It's very simple, <laughs> like, back and forth, back and forth. So, did right. you do that last minute sort of snag? Oh yeah, dude. I was like right at the table, like bam, at the last second. That's how I won. <laughs> nice. It. And then, yes. Gotta do it. Yeah, see, yeah. silent auction is so different because you can't hover menacingly over the person who's outbidding you. Especially you online. Like it's more. I was yeah, gonna say yeah. I've seen it done in person. I have seen that person just. Oh, I have hovered. Yeah, oh, I, I have hovered, hovered in person. Yeah. <laughs> I've also like... started quietly weeping when I want something, but it's completely fake, and they they're like just take it, and they usually pay for it. Yep. It's a perk of being disabled. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Another Disney World story. <laughs> yep. I love it. I love it. All right, <clears throat> Galen. Um, yeah. I'd love to talk to you about the commitment you've made to performing only in accessible venues. So tell us about that decision and the impact that it's made both for you as a performer and for your audiences. Yeah. Um, well, it kind of came about gradually. I think everybody has to kind of find their own journey to how they're going to advocate. But for me, I started touring shortly after I won the Tiny Desk and um, 
went on the road in a lot of venues. It's like right in bright red letters mm. on the top of my stage plot. Gail Lee is in an electric wheelchair and she needs a ramp. Please call her if this is a problem. But I can't tell you how many venues would be like, oh, well, we're just going to lift your chair up. I mean, most yeah. venues <laughs> were like, we're actually, we totally ignored that part of your stage plot. We're just going to lift up your chair. And so I would talk to them about how it, you know, it's like, equality nobody except for maybe beyonce gets carried on stage right um, right <laughs> and so i don't feel that that's equality so i would talk to them and be like maybe like great point yeah we really need to build a ramp but i would go back the next year and they would say well last time we just lifted you up and i realized that the change that i wanted to see wasn't going to happen unless i mm. set a firm boundary um with my own performances so what i decided to do is um, I would only perform in venues that have a wheelchair accessible bathroom, a wheelchair accessible entrance, and um, a place for someone in a wheelchair. And it's not all about wheelchairs, let me be clear. But like for me, this is the biggest barriers I was seeing at my shows. And then also a place if you're in a wheelchair that you could see the stage because sometimes the stage is upstairs, even if the venue, theoretically, you can get in the door, you can't get to the stage area. So. And then for me, I wasn't going to let people lift my wheelchair up anymore. Um, that doesn't mean that if a venue doesn't have a ramp to the stage that I refuse to play there, but I will play on the floor. And it makes sort of like a subversive message to the audience where they're like, hmm, wonder why she's on the floor. Oh, she can't get up there, you know? And so, yes. um, and the changes that that's made have been gradual, of course, um, but there's some positive changes, like a lot of venues, it still takes more work. So let me be real that I think the real change that we need to see is every single artist doing that, not just disabled artists. Um, right. I think that it will move a lot faster if we're all doing it at the same time. But, but I still have seen changes where I'll email the venue and I'll say, if you want to build a ramp, here's a YouTube video. If you want to rent a ramp, here's a place where you can do that. If you want to buy a ramp, here's where you can do that. And a lot of venues follow through and they do buy ramps or build ramps. And then the coolest thing is um, that more disabled people come to my shows now. You know, like if it says this is a wheelchair accessible venue, then people don't. I mean, I know the stress of like getting somewhere and being like, oh, crap, I can't use the bathroom. Wish I had known right. that, you know, or like, oh, no, there are four steps to get in. And I have to go through like maybe the kitchen and five other hallways <laughs> and yeah. get eaten by a rat on the way there. So mm -hmm. like it's better to have it be. Um, up front and and so my audiences are more diverse uh, physically and I think the best part for me is like sometimes people will come up after a show and be like you know you're the first disabled performer I've seen or they're a little kid with a disability and they're like I want to be a performer and the reason I do all this stuff because it is a pain in the neck like I'm not gonna lie it's a lot of extra work right now but I want it to be easy for a kid who's five years old right now to become a performer when they're 30 years old and I think it's not going to happen until we all just start saying enough is enough. And now we are changing where we play. So um, that's my mission. Uh, my, my favorite story from this whole experience was I played at a venue in North Carolina that was like a church converted into a venue. And it was mostly accessible, but they didn't have a ramp to the stage. But I was like, that's fine. I'll play on the floor. Anyways, he calls me a week before the show and said, well, two months ago, we held a fundraiser to buy an electric stage lift, oh, nice. and it's oh, getting installed nice. right now. And I like, I almost cried. I mean, I think I probably did actually get a little that's choked up because nice. it was like, how smart of him to like understand that you don't have to have it in your working budget. You can raise money for this stuff. You can like be creative and proactive and like just make it happen. And that was really cool to see. So yeah. Rant, rant, and rant. I just, I want yeah. to piggyback awesome. what, what Galen said because, um, I tour, I do about 200 shows a year. And when I got to the point in my career where I knew that people wanted me and that people would pay for it, I put it in my writer. Like I demanded there had to be ASL interpreters. There had to be closed captioning. The wheelchairs couldn't all be at the back of the room. Some of them had to be at the front. Even though I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, there had to be an elevator, a ramp, stairs with railings that weren't just there to be scenic, a stool that didn't spin or roll, and a mic in a mic stand. And I 
cannot tell you how often I show up and people hand me a mic and I'm like, where's the stand? And they say, we don't have one. And I say, did you read the writer? I can't hold the mic. And then they say, we'll hold it for you. And I say, no, Beyonce, don't share the stage with no one. You will not hold it for me. You will go get one. So it's, we wish that it wasn't a constant battle. It is a constant battle, but like she said, the shame game gets people to step up. They might not get it right your time, but like I'm a comedian and once I drag you, by the next year you have that elevator, <laughs> that like stair lift or something. But like you have to always think outside of yourself. And now that we live in this virtual world, every single event you do be like, is there captioning? Is there an ASL interpreter? Is this accessible to other people? Did we describe ourselves for people who can't see us? Like I look like the lost Kardashian, you know? So it's, it's tiring. It shouldn't be our job to educate people, but it is. <laughs> and I was gonna say, since the quarantine started, I, I started doing a show every single week on YouTube. So this fundraiser was in place of my normal show. It's usually at the same time on Sundays. and. <laughs> I decided about two months ago that I was just going to do captioning for every show. And because I can't have a wheelchair accessible physical show and then not have captions at my yeah. online show, like how hypocritical is that? But it's the, the thing is, is that is expensive. And so people, it's like, let's work to make uh, this just something where, I mean, I don't know where we're all doing this at the same time. So it's the norm. Like, I don't, you know, we're all right. Yeah. I'm, to- I've been trying to get YouTube to like, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say like, so I've been doing a bunch of talks, right? Let's say for instance, with really big organizations like women in music or the Academy and things like that. And they, they bring me in specifically to speak about disability because my whole thing is we need more diversity. Uh, We need disability to be considered a diversity. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I love that we're talking more about women, they were talking more about color, religion, um, preference, gender, and stuff like that. But disability is just never really on the agenda. So they'll bring me in and they'll go, oh my God, you're absolutely right. You need to speak about that very specific topic. And then I still have like the toughest time. And I don't want to put anyone on blast because I'm very grateful to be invited every time. But it's like, why am I still having a difficult time getting you to set up some of the basic things for the audience that you're trying to have Um, some of the basic things for uh, it's so it's so impactful for the people watching who are non-disabled to see this in the first place for them to do at their own venues as well because they're if they're learning about this they're learning how to do it as well Um, but you would be surprised um, and and look I don't think anyone's trying to be malicious for the most part. I mean, some people, who knows? But I, I, for the most part, don't believe anyone's trying to be malicious. They're just uneducated, they're unaware, and they always feel super bad, uh, but even then it is still quite the hassle. Um, and like, kind of like Galen said, it should become quite normal. It should be just become an extra thing. Every time we see a politician get up on stage and give us an update, we see an interpreter. We're seeing that more and more. Why don't we see that with everything? That should expand into entertainment. That should expand into music. That should uh, expand into comedy and into other things. So um, I don't know. I just, I find it interesting that it's still quite the struggle, struggle, even when it's well-intentioned. And I think standing up for yourself and uh, not being afraid to advocate, uh, advocation doesn't need to be rude. Uh, It just needs to be there and it needs to be. Sometimes it can be rude. Sometimes (laughs) it can be rude. Sometimes it can be rude because I know that's scary to be like the angry crip and it's something that we're, um, we're trying to avoid, but like each person does it their way. And with me, like I'm done. I'm like, it's 2020. You should be educated at this point. It's 2020 making your space accessible, makes it more accessible as strollers and cameras and brings you in more revenue. We have $8 trillion buying power. So like whatever is your style, you can do it because I think we've been told, I'm not saying this to push back on you at all, but just saying for me, I'm definitely I mean, I already walk in. I walk yeah. in as the angry black woman already. Yeah. So that's already yeah. just there. So Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like loud, I'm like loud jersey and I'm like, what did I say? What did I say? No, you're not gonna carry me. I cannot tell you the number of times that people have offered to carry me. It's like a I thing. Know. And yeah. I'm like, no, I am not a basket. 
Yep. This, oh man. This is Lauren. I'm the executive director of the Nora Project. Galen and I went to college together. Hi, Lauren. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Love you all so dearly. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to pipe in here that this is really exactly what the Nora Project is about. It's about making sure people are just aware of these very basic accessibility concepts from a really young age so that they become really normalized. And so hearing you guys talk about essentially exactly what is in our curriculum is really validating. Um, so I just wanted to chime in and just say, like, <laughs> you guys might be curriculum writers for us. You all are welcome. <laughs> Do we have questions from the peanut gallery? Are they gonna yeah, I was going to say, um, if, folks, if you have questions, now is the time to, um, you can go ahead and raise Now and never. In the chat. I got five minutes. Or you can type them into the chat. <laughs> Either way, the floor is open. Or just unmute and speak your piece. Yell. Shout out. We're all here. First question is always the hardest. Katie, do you have any others to like? I do. Like their whistle? I sure do. <laughs> um, so, okay, so all of you have dedicated a lot of time and energy to ensuring more representation of disabled folks in the media. Um, so, you know, you've touched on a few of these roadblocks already, but from, from like a representation standpoint, can you tell us a little bit more about like what are the roadblocks and how have you approached those challenges to get more disabled representation in media? You know, um, it's... In, oh yeah, you go first, Wes. Go ahead. I've been talking a lot. I mean, I just, I recognize no, that I have balanced. some... It's been balanced. I recognize oh, yeah. that I have a different situation. So I'm, I'm blind. So it's a little different for me. Um, and part of the thing is, is that unless I'm using my cane, uh, it's hard for people to know. And I only use my cane at night or in the dark. Um, mm -hmm. But then for, for a lot of the time, I'll hold things really close and I'll have to blow things up. And people think that instead of thinking I am blind, people tend to think I don't know things, mm. uh, that I'm slow or something like that. So that's a thing that I have to deal with constantly. And it's built like a complex of me always going, and I'm smart. Um, so mm. um, it, one of the interesting things that I have found, because I work in uh, music, I work in nightclubs, um, it's just an interesting situation that... <laughs> I find more, um, it's like people are tiptoeing a lot more around the fact that I'm a female and the fact that I'm black. Uh, and they don't seem to, it, it's, it's very difficult to just get people in the music industry to understand that disability is important. It feels like mm. it's a lot more noticed in like Hollywood and in acting and things like that. Um, but to get representation in the music industry just seems a lot more of an afterthought. It seems a lot harder of a push. Um, I don't know if you experienced this, Galen, um, but because I do, because I act and because I also sing, people are just so accommodating a lot more when it comes to acting. And when it comes to music, um, it's just not there. I have to scream with mm -hmm. a much louder voice. And, you know, when I sit in these like rooms with label execs like Sony, Universal, places I've sat where I, thanking my lucky stars that I got there, I'm sitting across the room from this exec and I'm thinking to myself, so I have to sort of teach you and you just gave me this amazing opportunity. How do I make sure that you don't feel like your ego has been hurt by me uh, pointing, th pointing these things out to you um, and you starting to think like, hey, hmm, maybe I should just work with somebody that's easier to work with or to let them know that, hey, I am worth money. I am mm. somebody you can market uh, because that's how they think. And so that has been a definitely a difficult roadblock for you to look at me and then look at another girl that is, you know, a young black female that sings and say, okay, I want to invest in Lachi as opposed to the next person who I don't have to worry about um, making sure she can see at night, making sure she can get into the club and all these little things that Lachi asks for. Thank you. I was going to piggyback on that real quick in, in the earlier conversation. Just, uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty underground artist compared to Lachi Maysoon and Galen. And he, hearing the conversation about um, advocating for yourself at venues, I, for the, for the past eight years as a musician, the, the, the way that I've had to do that because I don't want to like get kicked out of the venue or not be mm -hmm. invited to play again, you just have to push your way into the door. You have to get lifted up onto the stage. You have to 
you have to do all of that extra work to get your face in in front of the audiences and the and the the higher ups at the venues and the radio stations and you know blah 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 um and i i think it's really important for people with disabilities to see that as as well as the importance to see the accessible venues to see that we can advocate for ourselves because i think um a lot of disability is infantilized and mm-hmm. yep. you, know, you need help in, in your ad, in your advocacy but that's not the case like we can we change change is in the hands of the oppre- of the oppressed you know mm-hmm. like we can mm-hmm. do it amen um, Thank I, you. I just wanted to throw that in there as well Thank you. Oh, that was incredible and so important for all of us to hear and hear over and over and over. Um, we will follow up with the questions that were left in the chat, but unfortunately it is four o'clock and we have to wrap up. And I have a really important That was question. a really Wait, can we each have like a tiny co- closing thing? Like the yes. tiniest? Yeah. You go first, Mason. Okay, I won all my auction items. I just spent $830, so go to our project. Yeah, and people who need to find me, I'm at maysoon.com, like the month of May is coming soon, maysoon.com. I have a book on Audible, it's called Find Another Dream, and it comes with a downloadable PDF in ju- just in case you can't listen. Thank you, Nora Project. You're awesome. Yeah, awesome. thanks, Maysoon. Thank you, thank you. Sweet. All right, uh, Gabe. Yeah, the very last thing I wanted to say is that I think the biggest barrier or like thing that we need to realize is what I think people realize today when they watch is that often we portray in our culture disability as like negative or sad or something to be avoided. And so, or, or a bunch of obstacles, like even ramps, right? Like we talk about the obstacles a lot, but how much are we talking about how just how awesome disability culture is? Like it's actually good and cool and like fun and there's good stuff happening. And I think, um, you know, taking the negative language out of the way we talk about disability, which is something the Nora Project works on, but we should all be, we shouldn't be suffering from disabilities or victims of a stroke or confined to wheelchairs or like sad, pathetic lives. Like that's not what the message that I'm trying to send. And I know that's not what all of you are trying to send. And so like, let's talk about how to make disability culture like celebratory and like not despite our disabilities, but because of our disabilities. Like Gabriel, you wouldn't have written that song if you hadn't been you, you know what I mean? And like people liked the song, so they have to respect your disability as like a valuable part of your identity. And Tina too, with your painting and everybody has something, especially in disability culture, that's like celebratory. And I think we miss that a lot. And if you wanna check out my shows, it's every single Sunday on the same channel you just watched the Nora Project on, and I'll be doing those for a full year, and I have different guests every week, so um, thanks again to the Nora Project, and if anyone else wants to wrap up with a goodbye. Thank you. Really fun. Thank you, Nora Project. You guys can find me at Lachi Music, L-A-C-H-I-M-U-S-I-C. I am a singer, songwriter, musician, actor, model, everything you want and more. Everything. <laughs> Gabriel, do you have the band camp at least, right? Yeah, I have the band camp, and then I'm all over social media, at a cripples dance, um, and then at Freak I love Dome. that. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm still kind of figuring out how to operate in this COVID world. I'm, I'm much more of a performer rather than uh, kind of an online presence. Um, so, yeah, L- look right. out for some stuff, because I got some stuff in the works. Yay. Awesome. I love you you all. This was so much fun. Thank you for including me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nora Project. Uh, Thank you. And Tina, we can find you at Passionworks, right? Uh, Yeah, but I'm working from home. Okay. All right. Wonderful. From Passion. Thanks for your support, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for helping make this an awesome event. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.